Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Waldrop, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine in preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria. The only way that a person would get to the point to say, I long for nothing else as long as you are glorified, would be if we see God for who he truly is. That we have to see that or we'll never feel that way. We'll never commit to that. But when we see God for who he is, anything else is ridiculous. That God be glorified is the most obvious an appropriate thing to happen that could possibly happen when we see God for who he is. When we don't, when we are, for example, as uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, blinded by the God of this age, we don't see that. When we are dead in our trespasses and sins, we don't see that. Really, you could say that the difference between the people of God and those who are not are the, those people who see and understand God for who he truly is and those who don't. So we need to understand who he is. And I, I don't want us to sing a song like that lightly. I want us to understand that song expresses very well the heart of a Christian when the Christian is living in obedience to the Lord. So... That's a good song. That's a good song that that gets uh, that preaches to us, and it's in the form of a prayer. So, I encourage you take it, use that. You know, you can find it on YouTube real easy. Look at those look at those lyrics and see how reasonable they are when we understand who God is. Well, we are uh, we're looking in First Corinthians, and I had planned to get through verses 4 to 15 in 1 Corinthians 3 today. What we'll do is we'll read that, but I am, uh, I've become convinced just thinking about what we're doing today that it would be good for us to review baptism, um, which of course fits into what happens in Corinth we already took the opportunity a few weeks ago to look at baptism because of what, what we find in chapter 1. Um, so maybe we'll review that a little bit and, and just make sure we all understand it. I don't want you to think of our worship meeting today as ending and we're dismissed and then a few of us reassemble for a different thing, baptism. Uh, we almost put the baptismal pool in here today just so that you wouldn't think we got two separate things today worship and baptism no today the baptismal uh, time is part of our worship so I really encourage you to stay for that and uh, I want us to understand that let's let's read what we had planned to read and just to know that the plan will be uh, we'll need to spend some more time in this uh, Lord willing next Sunday um labor dependently and build wisely. So let's let's look at this and um, we'll go ahead and start with verse 1 in 1 Corinthians 3 so we get the context. Uh, <clears throat> he's not Paul as he writes and remember he's writing to a group of people that he led to the Lord in his work he and those with him uh, when they went to Corinth. Um People who had not heard the gospel, he preached it to them. <clears throat> During his second missionary journey, you can read about that in Acts 18. And so he's, he's writing to people that he had led to the Lord. And by now, he's several, you know, some more years have gone by. He's probably writing from about 55, the year of our Lord, 55, 80, 55. And he's not pleased with the way things are going. 
1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. There's, by the way, nothing wrong with being an infant in Christ if you have just come to Christ. There's no way to avoid that stage. It's a wonderful stage. We would love to see all the people who are currently not in Christ become infants in Christ. And then after you've been in Christ for a while, it no longer is appropriate to be an infant in Christ. And that's what Paul is saying. You're still infants, and we're a few years into this. So picking up in verse 2, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, slaves, through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building on it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ or Jesus the Messiah. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. One translation says, but only as one escaping through the flames. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to understand what the apostle has written here by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Help us to relate it to what we're experiencing. Help us to apply it as we look at baptism. Help us to understand what it is, why it's important, what it's not. May your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this is where he is, uh, where we are in 1 Corinthians he is explaining, he's returning to the, the problem that he believes deal, needs dealing with the most in the Corinthian church. And there's all manner of problems, as when we go through the book you'll see. But the one that he deals with first and he is most uh, concerned with is found in 1 Corinthians 1.10. The reason this book exists is because of his becoming aware of problems in faith and practice in both what they believed and how they acted. Now, he never stopped treating them like true followers of Jesus. He, the, as we've seen, chapter 1, those verses 4 to 9 is full. Uh, they're full of descriptions of the blessings of salvation and what it means to be saved. He calls them brothers. He refers to them as the called who call. And here's the problem, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. That's a problem. It's a problem when that's not happening in an assembly of the followers of Jesus, like, for example, this one. That's a problem when there's division, when there's schism, when there's not unity, when there's not the same mind, when there's not the same judgment. Uh, the problem is what he says in verse 13. 
is Christ divided? And the answer to that is no. So now he's returning to that uh, after he talks about the, the gospel, he, he's, to deal with that problem, he starts at the very beginning and talks about the gospel, the word of the cross. And it's folly to those who are perishing. He acknowledges that. The world thinks we're ridiculous religious nuts. That's what they think. Um, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's, it's the only way of salvation there is. There's no hope outside of the cross in which the Messiah, the chosen one of God, was executed in the most humiliating and painful way possible, devised to be that on purpose by the Roman government. Roman citizens were not executed in this manner because they were considered to be above such a terrible, humiliating death. And yet we're saying that the Son of God, the one who is exalted forever, came and he came to die in this very way. And that's folly to the world and a stum stumbling block to Jews, stumbling uh, stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks or Gentiles. So he's he's reviewing all this. And he talks about then the blessing of the wisdom that comes from the Spirit. When we understand it, we believe it, we receive it, we are saved by it. Um and we can live by this. We are spiritual people, not natural people. We can understand the gospel because of the work of the Holy Spirit. And so he revisits it. Why are you saying, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos? As, these, as if these are two different religions or two different ways of living? No. No. Paul, Paul and Apollos, first of all, they're nothing. Paul can't save anybody. Apollos can't save anybody. And both of those were preachers. Paul, of course, himself writing the epistle. Preachers can't save anybody, only God. So it's ridiculous to put your loyalty into some preacher. The loyalty and the trust must be in God because he's the one who gives the increase. And Paul says, I labor and Apollos labors, but we labor dependently. We labor cooperatively, we labor dependently. And so that's the way we ought to labor. We ought to be here today not to impress God. I'll just tell you right now, if you came here today and you thought, today I'm going to go to church and worship God, boy, will he be impressed. <laughs> He's not. He's not. Some of the reasons that you could think about that he's not is, you know, if you would have great strength and health and nutrition, by the way, which he would supply, but even if you did, maybe you make it 100 years. Okay, let's compare that to God. The concept of year only exists because of the way he thinks, and he created time as a way for you to get from one point to the next in your existence. He doesn't need that, but you do. He is eternal, infinite. So there's one example of why he's not impressed with any of us here today. Uh, so, no, he's saying, I'm not, don't trust in me. Don't trust in me. Don't trust in Apollos. Trust in God. He's the only one that can give growth. He's the only one that can give increase. Labor dependently. But I want to show you the connection Part of his argument here of being a servant is found back in chapter 1. Again, this is the same thing. He's dealing with the, the division. Let's, let's read this, 11 to 17. It's been reported to me by Chloe's people. Ms. Chloe was uh, uh, somebody in the church there, and we don't know how or why, but some way she got a report to Paul, and he heard this. But there's quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, which is another name for Peter, or I follow Christ. This is probably the, the, the super spiritual party. I follow the Messiah only. These might be people who would say, I would never read something written by a man, a commentary or something like that. I would only just 
the Messiah just teaches me directly. Okay, that You better be careful about that, right? Because God's plan is He uses people like Paul to minister to people and to teach them. And we read in Paul's writings that there are pastor teachers that he expects to shepherd to guide people. So don't throw out all of the ministers and look at the, the people over here. I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter. And then this group over here, I'm of none of them. I don't want any of them. I'm just going straight to Jesus. I don't need a church. I don't need... Don't, no, that's wrong too. See, they're in the same group. He's saying, look at this. This is wrong. Of course, what he's saying here is that the division itself is wrong because 13 is Christ divided. Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So, so I want you to see there is a connection in, in our topic that we had scheduled today, labor dependently. Paul is a servant. Paul baptized, but that was not the most essential thing that he did. He felt like his, min his ministry mission was summed up. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. What can we take from that? We can take from that that baptism is important. Paul baptized people, and he referred to baptism. The Corinthians were practicing baptism, water baptism, but it is not the baptism that saves. It is the gospel. Uh, in our Bible study this morning, uh, we looked at the book of Habakkuk and we found that the foundation for Christian doctrine is in that book in what's called the Old Testament. The just shall live by faith. We, we live because we trust God to do what has to be done because it's Him who gives the increase. He, he is the one who gives the growth. He doesn't throw out some potential and then the people who are smart enough or spiritual enough or righteous enough kind of activate it and they have salvation. No, nobody can do that. So he does it and he does it by grace through faith. Baptism is a depiction of what happens in salvation. And I want, to, I want to take some time and show you that uh, before we go and celebrate it. You'll see it, and I want to tell you, make sure that you know what you're seeing and those participating, we for sure want to make sure you know uh, into what you are participating. What, why are we doing this? So, so don't, uh, let, before we leave this, let me make sure you understand what we read about the judgment. That's a judgment of believers and it's a judgment of believers based on how they served God. The foundation is laid in everyone's life who's going through this judgment called the judgment seat of Christ. The last verse gives us, gives us the assurance that this is a judgment of believers only. Everybody in this judgment that's described in our passage is saved. But there will be people who receive rewards for how they served God, what they did with the grace that was given them, if they grew to a point where they said, as long as you, I long for nothing else as long as you're glorified. Either we get to that, which is par for the course. That's normal Christianity. It's not radical Christianity. That's what is normal for a Christian to say, my only ambition ultimately is that God be glorified. Either we get to that or we live this life saved and yet clinging to the world. And then we discover my whole life was worthless in the kingdom of God. I was just the beneficiary of salvation, but I did nothing to further his kingdom. You don't want that. You're not going to be pleased if that's you just escaping through the flames. You're saved, uh, but you have no nothing in your life that was purely for the glory of God.
You don't want that. Now that's better. <laughs> the worst recipient, the worst, the most judged person at the judgment seat of Christ is in a far better place than anybody that shows up at the great white throne judgment, which is for the purpose of dis distributing justice. Uh, that is a terrifying judgment. The Bible says in Revelation 20, from whom uh, heaven and earth flee. I think that's the moment where uh, the old earth is burned up and the heavens are burned up with a fervent heat that Peter refers to. And because right after that, the judgment, that happens, and then we get the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation 21. But I, I don't want you to misunderstand this judgment and think this is the judgment of where it's decided, well, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell. No, no, no. That foundation is laid. It can't be laid again. Either you're in Christ or you're not. That judgment is for the, for the purpose of rewarding God's people for the works that they did, which they only did because of the grace he gave. That's how gracious he is. He gives grace so that we might serve him, and then he rewards us for our service in the form of crowns, Lord willing, we'll get into that. Um, but we get a great picture, Revelation 4 and 5, what the, the 24 elders who are pictured in heaven do with their crowns. They cast them before the throne, acknowledging the only reason I would get a reward for any service was because of you, Lord Jesus. So, so let's, let's think, let's focus our minds on baptism I hope that that was enough to make you interested in, in hearing, hearing all the teaching on uh, chapter 3, 4 to 15. But let's make sure we understand baptism. I went back and forth on this because just a few weeks ago we had three sermons in a row on baptism. Let's understand it. Let's understand it. I want to show you a few places. We already read Matthew 28, 16 to 20, but, but go there. So we can understand. Let me let me uh, let me help you understand. There's an imperative in verse 19. The it's it's the main verb of 19 and 20. It's what Jesus said to do. It's the reason that we're here now and not already in glory with the Lord. Um, God has chosen to use His people as instruments of adding to the number of his people. He's chosen to use us. We are his witnesses. And so make disciples. That's the command of verses 19 and 20. You might say, well, there's another imperative. The first one, go. Technically, it's not. It's a participle. But grammatically, uh, the reason most translations put it in the form of a command, go, is because it's it's almost certainly a participle, and I won't bore you with the grammar, but it's to be interpreted along with the main verb. So that's why it's put in the same voice, the imperative. Uh, go make disciples. And that's important because that means we need to do more, even as we apply it to our situation here, than just gather here and say, well, everybody's welcome to come hear the truth. There's a go aspect to this. So go make disciples. The next two, there are two other verbal terms there, participles, and in English they come across in ing words. Do you see them? Baptizing in verse 19 and teaching, verse 20. This is a great Sunday, a special day, because we are seeing on display this church's obedience to both of the participles in, this, in the Great Commission that tell us how to make a disciple. Okay? He says, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. Now, baptism is a, is a one-time event where you show, I'm leaving the old and going into Christ. I'm the old man is put to death and I'm risen with Christ spiritually. That's what's going on. So it's a, we don't do that uh, 
We're not to do, that's not an ongoing thing. That's a, that's a one-time thing. That's what we see in Scripture. But the teaching goes on all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've got the books of the New Testament uh, full of teaching about following Jesus. And we haven't mastered all of it. And we won't master all of it. Uh, not even all the way until when the Lord comes again. So we're teaching. That's what we're doing. This room is set up for teaching. Why is it set up for teaching? It's set up for teaching because Jesus said, make disciples teaching them. Teaching them some of my favorite sayings that you like. That's not what it says, is it? Why do we, why do we teach systematically? Why don't we go through books? Why don't we have a a Bible study going on on Sunday morning, which we're giving you an overview of every book of the Bible. Why are we doing that? Why? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. We're doing that because Jesus said, make disciples, teaching them all, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. We don't want to skip any of it. We want to direct you to, to observe everything that Jesus has commanded. Now, it takes some time to do that, doesn't it? We can't meet here one Sunday and say, okay, we've learned all that Jesus commanded, now let's go out and do it. <laughs> There's too much. Uh, it's comprehensive. It's, it's our lives. As a matter of fact, in order to observe it, it takes our lives. It takes our lives. It's not about a meeting, getting some knowledge, check it off. Because he's saying, teaching them to observe. So that's why we're doing this. Why we're doing what we're about to do is because of that first participle baptizing them make disciples baptizing them teaching them why do we say you need to be baptized before you remember the church you need to be baptized before you receive the lord's supper because jesus said make disciples baptizing them we would never say well the lord jesus told us to make disciples baptizing but you know, you're just kind of not sure about baptism, so we grant an exemption. Don't worry about that one. Since there's teaching about baptism, it's not going to work. I mean, even if you just tried to skip, no, let me just go to the teaching. Let me just observe everything that Jesus commanded. Okay, well, here's something that he commanded. Make disciples baptizing them. See, that's not optional for a church. If you're in a church that says, we'll just grant you an exemption of that if you don't like it, you're not really in a place that God considers a church, I fear. Because how could they say, we love Jesus and not do what he said? Since Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. And Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? Well, he said this, and so we're doing it. We're doing it. We're baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're doing it. Let's understand it a little bit. Uh, turn to Romans, <clears throat> Romans chapter 6. Paul's answering a question here, and he starts using references to baptism. Romans 6, uh, let's read 1 to 11, 1 to 11. Why should we say then, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And the, the reason he's saying that is he's teaching that salvation is that God deals with our sin by his grace. And so if that's true, the question is, so should I... Maybe I'm just can go on sinning and God will take care of it with his grace. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. 
We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. That is one who has died in Christ. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now there's a reference to baptism here. And what we need to understand is this is the baptism about which John the Baptist said, I'm baptizing you with water. And he had a ministry. He was the forerunner to the Messiah coming, Jesus coming. And he had a baptism of repentance and people expressed their willingness to repent by being baptized, by being immersed in the water. And this was a difficult thing for the people of Israel to hear because typically it would have been a Gentile that would be called upon to repent of their pagan ways and, and put their faith in God, the God of Israel. But now John the Baptist is coming and he's saying this to Israel, repent. That was hard for them, but that's the background. That's what's going on here. But he said, I'm baptizing with water. There's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, with God, the Holy Spirit. This is different than a, a ceremony that pictures something. This is the thing that the ceremony pictures when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is the essential thing. That's what he's talking about. Look what he says. Verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, and you can think of the word immersed, because that's what that word means, immersed into Christ Jesus, were immersed into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by immersion into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. This is what happens spiritually when a person is born again. The Holy Spirit spiritually unites the sinner, which and everybody's a sinner. I'm talking about people who are getting saved, sinners who are being saved. Unites the sinner to Christ in such a way that he becomes a participant after the fact in the death of Jesus, his receiving the wrath of God and his death and his resurrection. So spiritually... What happens is that sinner, which is described as being dead in trespasses and sins, is made alive to God. Jesus literally accomplished that. He literally received the wrath of God against sinners on the cross so that God, who said the soul that sins shall die, there's not a single sin that will ever go unpunished either in Christ for the believers or the sinners themselves will receive the punishment. That's what Jesus did. And he, he died, was buried, and rose the third day. The Holy Spirit unites us as believers into that so that it counts for us. We participate in that. So water baptism is a testimony that that is what happened. It testifies to that uh, in a couple of ways. First, it testifies to what Jesus did. And so you're going to see Pastor David baptize, uh, and you're going to see Ashley and Jax one at a time. You're going to see them depict the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to get a, a visual picture of the gospel, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But it also pictures the testimony of one who's, who's been blessed by this spiritually. I have been crucified. Look at Galatians chapter 2, Galatians 2.20. Paul gives this very testimony for himself. Galatians 2.20 Water baptism is a testimony to this spiritual reality. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so when that, when that person is immersed in the water like Jesus was immersed in the grave, that's a testimony to say, my sinful flesh, the old man, dead in Christ, died and just as Christ was raised, now I am raised to walk in newness of life. Now I'm alive spiritually. I was dead, but because of what Jesus did, now I'm alive spiritually. That's what Paul is saying. I have been crucified with Christ. It is, not, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Remember, that's what Habakkuk said. The just shall live by faith. By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now there are denominations that teach that it is the water baptism itself that saves. It is that ceremony that washes away sin. Roman Catholicism calls that, the Latin phrase is ex opere operato. It's by the working of the work. So it's really not that big a deal who we're talking about. It's Is it an ordained priest in the right place in the right event? If it's that, and personal faith is not so much the essence of the thing. It's that it is the real church and a real person who does this ceremony and the ceremony zaps your sins away. The water baptism cleanses. Uh, churches of Christ, especially those hardcore ones like back in Mississippi where I'm from, it was made clear, a friend of mine talking with a pastor, that pastor said, no, it's right now he would say to me, for example, you would die and go to hell. Yes, you've been baptized, but see, your baptism is not accurate biblically because you weren't trusting that water at that moment to save you, and so you're lost. What did I just read out of the Word of God? The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yes, I was baptized, and I'm Praise God that my baptism was a testimony to my faith in the Son of God who died and was buried and rose again. My testimony that I in Christ have died to sin and been raised to new life. That's my testimony because of my faith in Him and what He did. Amen. Not what some ch event a church scheduled or some ceremony and said, okay, at this time we'll say this and then you say this and then we'll say this and God will be obligated to forgive that sin because we read the script Amen. and did what it said. Blasphemy. Amen. No, only God gives the increase. Only God can save. Look at Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. Now among the people of Israel, circumcision was very important. It was a sign that you were indeed a physical descendant of Abraham and therefore an heir of the promises God made to Abraham. Um, what came to be revealed, and really it was never hidden except for those who weren't reading with spiritual uh, comprehension, was that this being born as a physical descendant and being a recipient of the promises uh, was an advantage, but it could not replace the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And sin stops all of the descendants of Adam from doing that. It even stopped Abraham. Abraham didn't do that until God worked in him. So Paul had to work to explain the physical ceremony and reality of circumcision among the males does not make you right with God. In fact, this is all the way back to Deuteronomy, the law, the Torah. That's made clear. It's the circumcision of the heart, a, a, a spiritual Circumcision is, is what is actually important. We see that here in Colossians 2, beginning in 11. In Him, that is Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. That is, it's not a physical one. By putting off the body of flesh, and by the way, that's, you see that testimony of that as the person is immersed into the water, putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. But what he has done and what he does and the application of that to you by the Holy Spirit, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him, look at these words, crucial words, through faith 
in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, not through following the script of a religious ceremony. Do you see those words in your Bible? You need to know that. Spirit baptism, John the baptism, I baptize with water, one's coming with you who is able to immerse you with the Holy Spirit. That's the spiritual reality to which Ashley and Jax are giving testimony. That happened. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They and all the rest of us who are saved heard the word of God and we believed because of the work of God in our hearts. So this is not a ceremony which saves them. It's impossible. We don't have the power to do that. We, we can't dispense salvation. We can't convey what God alone conveys. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says that salvation is the gift of God. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves or of any church or any ceremony or anything that you do that would cause God to say, well, they did it, so now I'm obligated to save. Not the way it works. God is sovereign in salvation, not the church and not the sinner. So that's what we're doing. If you have further questions about this, then ask. Let me know. You're about to see this, and I praise God for that. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Your death, burial, and resurrection is our only hope. It's a historical reality. It's not, an, it's not a myth. It's not a story. History testifies to it. Most importantly, your word tells of it. And we have victory in Jesus because of what Jesus has done. So, Lord, I pray that you'd be pleased with, honored by, blessed by, glorified by this baptism. Uh, that you would, that you'd be worshipped by it, because that's our desire. We want to obey you. We want to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because we've been commissioned to make disciples, and we do this trusting that our obedience is pleasing to you. But God, we know that it's not this ceremony. It's not even anything that we do, but it's what you have done because you give the increase, you alone. All the rest of us are servants, we're instruments. And God, you, we're not only that, but Lord, though we're unworthy, we're objects of your love and your salvation and your redemption. And there's a time coming, Lord, where we won't sing songs anymore that talk about the lowest valleys and the times of poverty because there won't be any more. And we'll praise you perfectly then. But Lord, now I ask you bless us as we obey your word through baptism. And if there's one here today who doesn't understand why, why this is happening, what's going on, Lord, I pray that you would um, help them to, to know, Lord, and we want to help. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're, 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 we're excited today. Um, you know, last, uh, last Sunday when we announced that we were going to have baptism today, Jax came up to me and he said, you going to have baptism next week? Yeah. He says, I haven't been baptized. I haven't been baptized as a Christian. Can I get in on it? I said, oh, yeah. So, so we spent a couple hours probably talking about what it is to be in Christ, what baptism is about, much like Pastor Michael did today. So, uh, you ready? Ready. Okay, let's go. <laughs> He's got to go first. Okay. Yeah. Derek, just stand there. Yeah. Are you going to sit back with us? Yeah, right. <laughs> All right.
So, that's beautiful. Tex is excited, knows, uh, thank you for that reinforcement today, why he's doing what he's doing today. Do you have something to say? I uh, just want to say that it is my, a testimony to my faith um, and to identify with Jesus in his life, burial, and resurrection. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, let's breathe. <laughs> Based on that confession of faith, my brother, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so if you would hold your nose with one hand, or breathe out, <laughs> and, and then uh, I'm going to leave you down there so you can experience something like a death. You tap me when you want me to bring you up. <laughs> and then when I do, you'll be raised to walk in that new life that Pastor Michael talked about. Okay? Heard in Christ. Raised to walk in that new life. And we have a certificate for Jax over here, as well as uh, a gift that uh, Dennis Hillman, Dennis and Eva Hillman, are not able to be here today, but they made these up, uh, wanted to celebrate the baptism with you, so come pick this up when you get dried off, you don't want to grab it right now, I don't think, so that's there, this does not convey uh, salvation, it's just a <laughs> commemoration of the event. <laughs> Ashley, uh, let me let me let me tell the story a little bit, and then Ashley's going to read some scripture for us. Uh, three three weeks ago, I guess you you showed them. Hmm? Yeah. I said, okay. Uh, came and uh, and I welcomed her by the door, and I said, "Oh, what brings you here?" And she says, if I tell you, I'm going to start crying. I said, great, let's cry together. <laughs> and, uh, and we did. And then, uh, then Aurora uh, shared with her the gospel. And about 20 minutes later, brought Ashley back to Michael and I and said, we have a new sister in Christ. So I was just, and I'm, I'm still ready to cry together. You know? uh, so share with us whatever you want to share. Okay. Uh, I was just going to read. Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. I've repented my sins, believe Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. And I want to follow him and obey his command to be baptized. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you. Okay, my sister. So based on that confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You're going to be buried with him in the likeness of his death and raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection to, as Michael said, walk in a new life. Okay, you ready? You want to hold your nose? Okay. And you just tap me with a squeeze when your mom to bring you up. Ready? Buried with him. for you and a gift from Dennis and Eva and it'll be right here when you get dry. Oh, crazy. <laughs>